Well, Booby, uh, Rocky Jones, Winky, and the whole lethargic gang is back again in your experiment today in the long-awaited sequel to Manhunt in Space, Crash of the Moons, plus a general hospital short. Need I say more? time we watched season four episode 17 crash of the moons in which rocky jones and winky save not one but two entire planet populations from utter destruction and there's another general hospital short (gasps) but first we've got some news and follow-up yeah not the happiest news no uh the news is that the turkey day marathon happened And the fundraising effort for season 14 happened, and they did not make their fundraising goals. No. They raised $2.7 million, or would have. I mean, it's a Kickstarter-style fundraiser, so the money all went back to those of us who gave. Um, But they raised $2.7 million with about 18,400 and change contributors, which is a pretty good showing considering they did honestly, yeah. Basically nothing to promote this Kickstarter type thing. And couldn't for a long time. Because they were restricted by the strike still happening, so they they couldn't do too much. Well, there's a whole lot that could be said about what they could or couldn't have done, and lots of people have been saying things like that. And I have my opinions. I've shared them elsewhere. I don't really want to get into them here. I am glad that they are going to take stock, look at what they did, look at what their options will be, and try again at some point with hopefully a better plan. Hopefully a more successful plan, right? Or... I don't know, maybe different levels. I have to say of the things that they uh, wanted to do, um, revamping older episodes to make them like beautiful and new, uh, not as important to me as having brand new episodes. So I don't know, maybe there's something to be done about that too. But again, as you say, there's lots of changes that they could make in order to revamp a fundraising campaign for the future. Yeah. So there are things like that. And I, I don't think the make them sparkly process is all that intensive. It's just one guy who does it. <laughs> so like, I mean, I think a lot of people feel like they were told with the previous Kickstarter that they would be asked not to do another Kickstarter-style thing, Mm -hmm. and that it doesn't seem like they've capitalized on how much they were able to raise last time in order to make sure that they could come up with a more sustainable solution than a big Kickstarter-style campaign. But, you know, whatever. That's, they got to do what they got to do, and they're not giving up just because this didn't make it, and that's good. I'm very glad for that. Because honestly, the last thing that we want is for them to be like, well, shucks, I guess people don't want any more MST3K. And that's patently untrue. Look at all of the work that's being done with the Mads and with Rift Tracks and with all of those things. Like, there's so much MST3K-esque things out there. This is just a different package of it. So I hope they're able to come back with a new campaign soon. In other news, well, we've got a bit of follow-up. Uh, we talked a little bit last time about colorblindness, mm-hmm. and devoted listener Jess wrote in to us on our Patreon-exclusive friendly little Discord, saying, The colorblindness thing made me think of my friend's husband, who is very severely colorblind. His biggest issue is with the single flashing traffic lights. Oh. He doesn't know if it's a flashing yellow or a flashing red. Oh. So he has to decide. Assume it's a flashing red light and stop every time, or assume it's a flashing yellow and just yield or drive through. He chooses the former and often gets honked at by people behind him wondering why he's stopping at a flashing yellow. Honestly, it's the safer of the two choices. There's no question about that. But yeah, that's so... I didn't even think about that, right? Like, didn't even think about that when we were talking about colorblindness before. It seems like the whole red, yellow, green in a very specific configuration is with the thought of people being colorblind in mind. I'm surprised that they don't have a solution for the red and yellow flashing lights. But obviously, like... They don't, and and it's rare enough that they're not really thinking that it's necessary, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't I, I don't drive, so I don't experience this directly. But I, I do think that, you know, that seems like a, a basic accessibility fail and that they should look into that. Definitely. 
Definitely. Uh, there's one other piece of follow-up that I feel like we should touch upon. You know, this show is well known and and proudly known as being the MSC3K podcast made by those Canadians. And there's been a big asterisk on that for a good long time because you <laughs> are not, not Canadian, Canadian at yeah. all. And Adam and Beth are, you know, fully Canadian from the days they were born. That's true. But I've been sitting here as a longtime resident of Canada and a bit of an interloper. You know, I, I had my I had my PR card, I had my green card equivalent, but uh, I was not actually a Canadian citizen who got to vote for Canadian things and whatnot. Well, that has changed since the last time we spoke with these nice people listening. I am now a Canadian citizen. Congratulations! Very exciting, very lovely. I believe I will be talking all about this elsewhere for special members only podcast for anybody who supports us on patreon so keep an eye and ear out for that if you are one of the nice people who's able to support us on patreon excellent all right we need to get to talking about today's episode don't you think i don't know chris i feel like we should talk about you being a canadian citizen for like the next hour rather than actually talking about this episode but i know our listeners expect better from us so you know let's go time we watch season four episode 17 crash of the moons but first another episode in the continuing story of general hospital remember how previously on general hospital nurse jesse was trying to get her husband dr phil to host a celebration for dr ken and patient cynthia's engagement and dr phil was being all weird about it well Now it's time for that party, and it's just as dreary as you imagined. And even worse, Dr. Ken isn't going to be able to join them at the party. Patient Cynthia has to call a cab to go home. But no, 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 Dr. Phil won't allow that. No, 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 no. He'll drive her home. Nothing suspicious about that. Patient Cynthia suggests that Nurse Jessie should come along for the ride. But Nurse Jessie knows exactly what's going on. And if Dr. Phil is going to make an ass of himself and cheat on her, then she doesn't want to be there for it. And so she doesn't get to see Dr. Phil explain to patient Cynthia that it's perfectly normal that he can love Nurse Jessie in one way and love patient Cynthia in another more uh, urgent way, but also that patient Cynthia loves him and therefore cannot also love Dr. Ken. And so we learn that our two-timer has a double standard. Ah, well. Patient Cynthia decides to make out with him anyway. Tune in next time for more. Uh, oh, well, we did the episodes out of order, and this is the last bit of General Hospital the show did. Okay, well, in that case, the end. And now for our feature presentation. Remember Rocky, Winky, Vina, Bobby, the Professor? Well, their space adventures in space continue in this space movie. Rocky, Winky, and Secretary Drake go on a diplomatic mission to Ophetius, home of Cleolanta. Remember her? Mm -hmm. They offer the support of the Federation of Planets or whatever, but she refuses. Cleolanta certainly doesn't need any man's help. Ophetius doesn't need anyone's help. They have everything they need right here on Ophetius. But what if Ophetius wasn't going to be around much longer? That's what the movie Crash of the Moons promises. A crash of moons. And thus, the destruction of Ophetius. Sure, we start by thinking it might be Deep Space Nine that will be destroyed by the pair of moons linked together. But Rocky and Winky arrive just in time to push the space station out of the way. Perhaps their interference has changed the course of the linked moons because now everyone realizes one of the moons is going to collide with Ophetius. There's a whole, like, subplot with a crying baby living on one of the moons, and it's really annoying. Apparently, this kid is, like, psychic for danger, but when you live on a moon with crappy weather hurtling through the universe, you're in danger all the time. Or, you know, maybe just colicky. Anyway, Cleolanta tries to destroy the moon, which would kill everyone there, but selfishly save her planet. 
Rocky stops her with the help of her second-in-command, Atlasan. Winky, Mr. Secretary, and the gang evacuate the moon with the screaming kid, but the folks on Ophetius need to be evacuated, too. Rocky calls the Federation of Planets to bring lots of rocket ships, and they evacuate everyone on Ophetius. But Cleolanta does have to witness her people just completely ignoring her because her leadership style sucks. Instead, they follow Atlasan's wife, because she's, like, nice and stuff. Whatever. The Ophetians are evacuated and will be relocated to a new location, which, as you know, always goes well for everyone. The end. Oh, please, oh, please, let it be the end. Meanwhile, on the satellite of love, Joel is trying to teach Tom Servo how to do macrame when Crow comes in trying to get them to buy subscriptions to Grit. Oh, wait, except he doesn't have Grit the newspaper. He's got Grit the Grit. Well, anyway, the Mats present their invention, Deep 13 Choco Nutty Fudge Toothpaste. Sounds... Kind of gross, but Frank can't get enough. Joel and the bots present the rock and wreck guitar, which lets you destroy your guitar on stage, but then pop it back together and play another gig. The movie uses a, uh, a problematic term to describe moons that don't travel in a fixed orbit, and that problematic term happens to be the name of one of the characters on MST3K, and so this episode contains an otherwise charming sketch that happens to prominently feature that contentious term. So, yes, the phrase, under the gypsy moon, does sound a lot like a forgotten 1920s ukulele swoon tune, and we get Crow and Tom in a boat with a with GPC, serenading her until they're rebuffed. And hey, John Banner is in this movie. You know, the guy who played the beloved Sergeant Schultz in Hogan's Heroes? Joel and the bots celebrate him for bringing so much wholesome joy into the world. Fun thing to keep your eyes out for in this sketch, the nameplate on the desk with Banner Graham stenciled on it clearly uses an upside-down W for the M. That's fun. And Crow's got a new script, a new teleplay. After the ravishing success of Earth vs. Soup, Crow is back with an as-yet-untitled script that's filled to the gills with techno-babble. As Joel's character puts it, Kring jacks to full Klangdorn! Man the Klanger-danger-dang on the poop flu Tom and Joel aren't exactly blown off their flank and crook and socks. Anyway, after all that, the crew gets a letter with a poem in it, and then John Banner visits and is very excited to see everyone there. How happy he is! In order to get rid of him, Joel sends a Bannergram to Dr. Forrester. Banner continues to enthuse over Frank and Dr. Forrester during the closing credits. What do you think, sirs? Oh, Chris, you have to tell me that we're not watching another Rocky and Winky episode. I don't think I could take it. <laughs> Give me KTMA anytime. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is the last of the Rocky Jones movies slash TV show episodes stitched together into a movie that they did. Oh, thank goodness. So many more exist, and uh, they're all well-preserved and available oh. on YouTube for watching if you want to check out some of the other arcs of the show. The other arcs? Oh, are there arcs that don't involve Cleolanta? Yes. In fact, I think this is the last Cleolanta episode. Oh, that would be so good. Because they just, like, she just has resting bitch persona the entire time. Like, she's never nice to anybody. She's always super dismissive. It just makes you wonder how she even leads anything. And even when at the very end she's saying thank you, you know, like, Thank you for saving my people. It's still like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I just, it it really grates. It's so hard for them not to have given her a more fleshed out character. I mean, sure. I don't know. I kind of love it. I think oh. she's a lot of fun. Even wow. though it makes no sense. She's a terrible ruler. She's a terrible ruler. And it's seemingly a terrible person, but she does get to be really vindictive and she gets yes. to change her mind on a dime and it's 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 just i don't know it's fun it's fun oh, no no chris it is 
is not fun. <laughs> and it's not any better when she's like ousted by like the super nicest person ever who's like, oh, it's okay to be scared, everybody. Let's just work together to make this better. <laughs> it's like, oh, can't you have one female character who's a little bit more fleshed out? Like you have a mom, you have a floofy blonde thing, you have mean bitchy lady, and then you have like nice gal. I mean, come on. I mean, to be fair, it's not like the men are fleshed out. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's totally fair. <laughs> Rocky is beefy and Winky is sassy and yeah, no, there's the, they don't, there, there's nothing. There's nothing there no, in terms of character God. development or art. And it's entirely true when Joel is like the baby comes on screen and maybe it's not Joel. One of the riffers is like the first likable character in the film and it's a kid who's been screaming his head off for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, that's horrible. Even Dr. Phil is a little better than that and I couldn't stand him either. Maybe I'm just having a rough holiday season. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Did you like Bavaro, the the leader of the doomed moon? Oh, is that the John Banner? Like That's the, ho, ho, ho. That is John Banner, yes. I'm so happy to see you. Winky, may my son have a kind heart like you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was that it was nice to see that even the the original show is ragging on Winky a bit. Yes. Oh my gosh, a lot. Which is unfortunate cuz, you know, whatever. I want to ask you whether you still find Winky as attractive in this episode as you did in the first one. This is a very Winky light episode. He doesn't get to do anything, really. He's barely on screen. He doesn't get a song. He doesn't get any subplots of his own. I mean, he gets to flail on the couch and be unconscious. Like, Aah! That is nice. <laughs> but no, this doesn't really offer the Winky aficionado anything. I'm glad to hear it, because I'm, I'm just like, I don't even know if Winky can bring this back from the dead for Chris. This is just, oh, no good. But, you know, maybe maybe you like the bitchy Cleolanta. I don't know. We definitely got some letters from listeners who appreciated Cleolanta quite a lot. Really? Oh, well, oh, yeah. I have to respectfully disagree. I have to say... <laughs> I didn't find her grading in the first movie, but this movie, it didn't work for me. I don't think this movie is nearly as fun or successful as the previous movie. No. But what no. can you and, and And also, I don't think this episode is as fun as the previous episode, but what can you do? I don't know. I mean, the general hospital sketch only focused on like one, like, tragic intervention happening and like it, it wasn't showing me more of the characters which i have to say i appreciated in the first general hospital having a whole like hospital's worth of drama and not just like one couple i uh, in this episode i really appreciated that joel and the bots were supplying the subtext the whole way through right oh sure yes so many of the riffs are saying well here's what's really going on in this moment and uh, when I watched it as a kid, as, and not one who was particularly literate in soap opera conventions, uh, I found that very helpful to understand the plot. I like it when they make jokes that help you understand the plot. I mm. don't like it when they make jokes that make it harder to understand the plot, such as in the Rocky Jones movie, when there's a sequence where uh, Vina is trying to explain what the heck is going on with these two moons and why being in the middle of them might be a bad idea. Oh, the dancing scene with Bobby. And so she dances Ring Around the Rosie with Bobby to show that like two planets spinning around have a much bigger area of impact than one person spinning around. And it's this, let's not think about the science so much, but if that's what the science <laughs> is, this is a pretty good way to explain it. Sure. It's a fine illustration of that idea. And throughout the entire thing, Tom is basically doing a shut up and sit down woman bit, which like is coming out of nowhere and was very unpleasant. Yeah, I agree. That was a little rough. I have to say, though, like 
the subtext in the general hospital was not sub. No, no, no. Not in well, this no, episode. it wasn't. Right? Like, the first episode, like, having the idea that, like, I don't know if Dr. Phil is going to be happy when we invite Ken and Cynthia over. Like, it was subtext in the first one, Chris. I can totally see why someone would miss that. But in the second one, Dr. Phil was basically leering at Cynthia the whole time and practically sitting in her lap. It was ridiculous. There was no sub about what was going on at all. Okay, but I can only look at Nurse Jessie. Well, her face is telling you the whole story, too. Like, let's talk about text and acting. There's one good actor in this whole movie, and it's Nurse Jessie. (laughs) I wanted to talk a little bit about the plan. The plan? Well, Cleolanta's plan in particular. The plan to destroy the moon by shooting missiles at it, which will hopefully either destroy it or send it off in another direction. Because um, it's a weird plan. Sure. (laughs) I guess I should back up a little bit and say uh, that we're talking about rogue planets here. Not moons. Moons are things that go around planets. These are not moons we're talking about, even though that's what the thing calls. It's fine. It's fine. It's It's fine. fine. They're planets. And rogue planets are absolutely a thing. There are lots of them. There may be billions of them within the Milky Way galaxy alone. Totally tied together with a single atmosphere. No. I don't know about the atmosphere thing, though. I could see two of them getting into a, a synchronous orbit with each other. That is possible the way that twin suns do. Sure. I don't know. Maybe. Sure. Um, sometimes rogue planets actually do encounter suns and other solar systems and get sort of trapped in them for a little while. Mm-hmm. They don't usually hit other planets, so I guess that could happen. I mean, it's probably really not very probable. It depends on how big you think the universe is, right? But let's assume in the rocky universe, it's small enough that things are just rolling around and they're going to bump into each other. Sure. And like, you know, asteroids and, and large objects hit planets, you know, over the course of the development of Earth, we got hit by all sorts of things. That may be why we have a moon. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm a casual as far as astronomy goes. So (laughs) it's fine. Um, But how easy is it to move a moon out of orbit? Now, Mm. if we talk about our moon, which is probably much larger than the moon in this movie, but let's use it because that's what most people have thought about. Sure. Okay. How much force, how many bombs do you have to throw onto that moon to get it to change orbit in any meaningful way? Man, I mean, five wasn't enough. (laughs) Exactly. And those five bombs did what? Knock down a couple of buildings? Like, I don't even know if we're talking about bombs that are the force of the kind that we make these days. Yeah. Well, either way, uh, I tried to find out an answer to this. I looked at a lot of sources online. I'll put some links in the show notes. People love talking about this because it's a fun sci-fi question, but I couldn't find an agreement on what the answer would be. But basically, everybody seemed to agree that if we threw all of the bombs that we'd ever made in all of humanity's history at the moon, it wouldn't have much of an impact at all. It certainly wouldn't knock the moon out of orbit. Yes. The moon is very big, Mm -hmm. after all, and it's orbiting a much bigger planet, which affects it. Now, John Banner's moon isn't orbiting another planet. It's in an orbit with another moon, whatever. It's still going to be a huge hunk of rock in space, and it's going to take more than five missiles or 5,000 missiles, probably, to knock it from wherever it's trying to go. So, that's the science. This movie doesn't match that, and that's fine. I'm not trying to ding it. It is a piece of fiction, and it's trying to do its own thing, but I just thought it was interesting to think about it. No, I mean, clearly this movie hasn't followed science up till now, so why start halfway through? And, like, the movie is saying, or it's not saying anything, but it's asking some interesting questions, which it isn't going very deeply into, about the nature of, like, people and land, right? People and the land that they're from. Mm -hmm. What is diaspora? And what is a people when it no longer has its homeland? Which is a super interesting question. It's a super interesting question to ask in the mid-50s. It's a super interesting question to ask all the time. Sure. Thor Ragnarok, for example. Sure. This movie doesn't answer it in an interesting way, except try to have hope in a bad situation, which is not the worst answer, but it's not a complicated enough answer, perhaps, for the complexity of the question. But it is nice that it is asking these questions. Sure. I guess. I mean, 
what what is the what is the culture of officious and what makes it distinct from the culture that the federation of the federation of planets is bringing it never really even addresses that i mean if it can't give characters characterization it's really hard for them to think about making a whole society's worth of characterization you know what i mean yeah no all they get is john banner showing us a sense of what that moon is like. It's very happy. It's very jolly. It's very John Banner. I mean, his son doesn't seem very happy. I don't see how that's a complete characterization either. That's how they know something's wrong. Because that kid should be going there. (laughs) Seems to me like you're not going to get a kid going goo goo gaga unless you feed it and maybe change its diaper every once in a while, which all they do is they look at it in the Weber grill that it's being happy housed inside of there like i don't understand why it's crying we've been looking at it for hours <laughs> all right i don't know how much hot diaper changing action they were going to show in the oh, 1950s but... don't even have... the feeding would be like there's there's no discussion there's no discussion of like <laughs> has anybody fed this child <laughs> Has anybody picked it up? The only time they pick it up, even, is when they're going to bring it down into the uh, the basement to try and weather the storm, you know? It's like, maybe the kid just wants you to pick it up. I mean, I don't know what Dr. Spock would think about that, but... I mean, I <laughs> Dr. Spock. Dr. Spock would say, like... Oh, actually, I shouldn't go out on a limb and say this, but I think Dr. Spock, at least when my mom was a parent, was like, leave your kid alone to cry it out. Yeah, that's what I thought. So maybe this is what Dr. Spock would want you to do, except for the looking at it. Don't look at your child. Don't look at your child. Looking at your child is giving it positive reinforcement for its crying. You got to leave the room. These children are just vampires. They will suck the love out of you and use it to become evil. Exactly. And that's how Cleolanta was made. I can't handle the Rocky Jones stuff anymore, but we have more to do. And one of the things that we never did last time, well, I guess we sort of did it last time, but just with Winky, we talked about some familiar faces. Do we have more familiar faces in this movie? I mean, I'm not recognizing anybody, but... Well, surely you recognized John Banner. They did a whole skit about him. Well, I've never watched Hogan's Heroes. War stuff's not my bag. Like, that's not the show I would have watched. Hogan's Heroes isn't war stuff. (laughs) Hogan's... All right, all right. I'm surprised because it was, in fact, quite a, a commonly watched show in my household when I was a kid. I grew up a bit on Hogan's Heroes. It is not really a war thing. It is... Is, like it takes place in a prisoner of war camp during World War II, but it is very much a sitcom. I'm sorry. Let me just say that back to you so that you can hear how weird this sounds to me. It's a sitcom about being a prisoner of war in a prisoner of war camp. So did you ever see The Great Escape with, you guessed it, Donald Pleasance? No. Oh, okay. Did you ever see Chicken Run? Chicken Run. Yeah, I never saw it. No. All right. Well, Chicken Run's pretty good. The Great Escape is pretty great. It's got Donald Pleasance in it, so you know it's good. I mean, that's, yeah, it's it's very good. I watched a Columbo episode with Donald Pleasance recently. That man's a genius. Genius! There you go. Still haven't seen The Great Escape yet, though. Is this another Prisoner of War movie? The Great Escape is about a bunch of prisoners trying to get out of a prisoner of war camp and having Mm. some wacky adventures along the way. But it's a movie, so it's not just sitcom-level wackiness, which is what Hogan's Heroes was. So, sitcom-level wackiness yeah. in a prisoner of war camp. I guess yep. I'm ha- those things aren't meshing together in my mind really well. Yeah, I'm having a hard time here, Chris. Well, think about John Banner. So, John Banner played Sergeant Schultz, who was one of the guards, basically. Mm-hmm. And he was a big, bumbling fool who was very easily bribed by the prisoners. You know, they gave him a bunch of candy, basically, and he would eat the candy, and he would close his eyes to whatever was going on and say, I know nothing, nothing. Okay, and okay. that was like the running gag throughout the show. Okay. And uh, there was a much sort of meaner but also incompetent guy named Colonel Klink who was in charge okay. of it. And then you had a bunch of very sort of allied uh, – I think they were mostly Americans, but I can't really remember uh, – uh, prisoners who were – Oh, Richard Dawson was on it too. That's right. And oh. um, 
Yeah. Not in a three-piece suit, I assume. No, no, not as I recall. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense, you know? Yes. Um, I don't know. I I didn't rewatch A Hogan's Heroes for this because I wasn't planning on talking about John Banner this much. But, uh, you know, he is interesting. I I will say real quick, he was born in what was then Austria-Hungary, and his parents were Jewish, and then Germany invaded Austria in 1938. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. But he happened to be doing an acting gig in Switzerland. Oh, how lucky for him. Yeah, he arrived pre-Von Trapped. Nice. That is so helpful for him that he didn't have to climb every mountain or ford every stream. He kind of already arrived. He'd already done that. So he got out of there, got it to the U.S., and joined the U.S. Army in 1942. Wow. And then he got to work as a, an actor. He'd been an actor before, but he got to work in Hollywood as an actor, where he was generally cast as a German official, which oh. is totally what he wanted out of acting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure it's just like there are so many people who have Middle Eastern ancestry who are terrorists on our TV shows right now. And I'm sure that's exactly why they want to be actors. Well, exactly. But imagine if they had all escaped terrorists from their home country in order yeah. to get to America. So anyway, it's bad either way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. He's a fun guy. He is, seems to be as wholesome as everybody says, as far as I know. I don't know. Um, so, okay, that was John Banner. I guess we did a familiar face about him real quick. But actually, who I wanted to talk about was the other familiar face, who isn't even a face that we get to see, because I'm talking about the great Hollingsworth Moss, who directed this movie. Oh, is he going to be directing this movie? Mm, Hollingsworth Moss. What a name. What an amazing name. I know. What would you even go as by a nickname if your name was Hollingsworth? Holly? That sounds not okay. That doesn't sound like it has the same, like, masculine gravitas as Hollingsworth. Well, his first name was John, so. Oh, well, Hollingsworth is better. That was a good choice. (laughs) Okay. Um, yeah, so Hollingsworth Morse was a very prolific TV director. He directed all of Rocky Jones, sure. sure. He directed a bunch of The Lone Ranger. I have a question. Joel and the bots know that he did a whole bunch of Lone Ranger, right? Is that why they do the dun da dun da dun, 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 dun? Like they, they riff the Lone Ranger theme song at one point in time during the movie. They might have They would have known, known right? I don't know. I mean, Frank knows everything like that, so he might have known. He might have been like, we got to work the Lone Ranger theme in somehow, guys. Come on, let's work on it. So he also did a decent amount of Lassie. Mm-hmm. He did several episodes of the Dukes of Hazard. Oh my gosh. I he just, did an episode of Dukes Bonanza. Ah, oh, I love him. <laughs> and he did every episode of a weird little TV show called HR Puffin Stuff. This show you told me about, and I was just like, oh, wacky kids show. You know, it's British. Like, let's give it a watch. And I'm just like, Holy mother, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So you'd never seen HR Puff and stuff before? I've never seen it. It was so wild. (laughs) So the first episode is available legitimately and for free on YouTube. It's a little trickier to track down the rest of the episodes right now, although there are some clips on YouTube. So you can definitely get a sense of it. And they only made 17 episodes, so. I don't know how you would sustain that level of weirdness for longer. Like, it was just wild. Okay. How would you describe HR Puff and Stuff to someone else who has never seen it before? Um, there's a there's a young boy. Uh, he reminds me a lot of like a, a young 60s hipster. Okay. And he has a magic flute that talks to him. And there's an evil witch that wants to steal his flute. So he absconds where the wild thing style to an island where there's enormous puppets. They're not puppets. They're people in creature suits who are like, sure, I'll help you save your magic flute and get home again. And then there's just this wacky, wicked witch who can't do anything right, who's trying to steal the magic flute and she has, you know, minions. Mm Mm-hmm. I, I can't describe it beyond that, Chris. What would you add? I, I mean, <laughs> like, I, I mentioned the frog they beat in that episode. Toward the is one of the people in a creature suit. Yeah, but it's a frog who is also a Judy Garland impression. Okay, 
Yes. Well, <laughs> is it Judy Garland or is it Liza Minnelli? Because it seems where, way more Liza to me than it does Judy Garland. Uh, this this is from 1969, so it's probably still Judy. Okay. Also, it's named Judy Frog. I can't. Okay, okay. All right, fine. <laughs> fine. It's taking Judy Garland and making it a little extra. Uh, <laughs> Everything on this show is a little extra. I mean, even by Judy Garland standards, I suppose even it's a little extra. Even by Judy Garland standards. Also, she would have died by the time that episode came out. That's good, because I don't know if she would have really appreciated the frog impersonation of her. She, she might have. One of the people who made the show was made by a, a pair of brothers named Sid and Marty Croft. And one of them knew Judy because Sid had previously toured with her and opened for her. All right. In frog costume? Or was that just kind of... That was not Sid Croft in the frog costume. All right. All right. He was a puppeteer, and he wandered around doing all sorts of puppet shows and... I guess he did that. I don't fully have the details on how he opened for Judy Garland. But I will say, uh, they went on to make a bunch of other kids' TV shows. And I didn't grow up on HR Puff and stuff, although I was aware of it growing up. Um, Were you really? Where would you have been able to watch something like that? Because I just can't imagine any of my local stations carrying HR Puff and stuff. It was on in syndication. The one that I saw a lot of was The Land of the Lost, which was about people who went back in time into dinosaur land times. Okay. Yeah. It had live action people and then there were stop motion dinosaurs and uh And that was an episode of HR Puff and stuff? No, no, it was another show. They put out like oh, a dozen different oh, shows this team. Okay. I was trying to imagine the HR Puff and stuff kid with his magic flute and his like Judy Garland friend frog in the land of the lost with a whole bunch of dinosaurs. And it was actually a really intriguing thought. That could be a really good show. It could be. Um, they also did other shows. One was called Lidsville. One was called Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. I don't know. I, I, th- these I didn't especially see, but these were some of their uh, puppet shows. They also did shows with humans involved, such as The Brady Bunch Hour. Stop it. <laughs> you know, the variety show that The Brady Bunch sure. did. Mm-hmm. You got to keep on, keep on. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. They did uh, Donnie and Marie. Oh, yeah. I'm a little bit country. <laughs> uh-huh. They did Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell sisters. It, it, they did it all. Uh, they were kind of amazing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, as we record this, uh, we recently lost Marty Croft, the younger brother, at the age of 86. Wow. That's a good run. It is a good run. His older brother, Sid the one who opened for Judy, is still alive at 94. Wow. Wow. And they are both originally from Montreal, so it is proper CanCon once again. I know that's why you brought them up. <laughs> like, I have to start talking about Hollingsworth Morris, but only so that I could talk about H.R. Puff and stuff and get to the true Canadian gold in all of this. Everybody, it's time for the Shallow 13. It's time for the Shallow 13. 13 factoids orbiting each other and about to crash into your ears. All about today's experiment, Crash of the Moons. Go, Chris, go. There's an old scientist in these Rocky Jones episodes, and Joel and the bots repeatedly joke that he looks kind of like the famous pianist Vladimir Horowitz. And they're not wrong, so let's start by saying a little bit about him, because he's pretty neat. Horowitz was born in 1903 in Kiev, which is now in Ukraine. It wasn't long before he was recognized as a phenomenal pianist. The Soviet Union had big plans for him, but in 1925, Horowitz went to Germany, allegedly to study with another piano great, Arthur Schnabel. But Horowitz had plans to head to the USA and never return home. And indeed, he had a long and productive career in the U.S. and didn't return to the Soviet Union until 1986, during a period of increasing political goodwill between the U.S. and the USSR. The concert was understood as a big deal and was broadcast on U.S. and Soviet television, and the CD of the concert topped the Billboard charts for at least a year. In fact, at some point in 1987, Horowitz albums held the top three spots on that chart. 
This was all after Horowitz had retired, for like the umpteenth time. The New York Times once called him possibly the most retiring and certainly the most often retired of great pianists, and this was in 1974. He would go on to retire a few more times after that, which seems fun, but... But his constant retirement was a sign of some personal difficulties he had. Depression, alcoholism, memory loss all plagued him. And he also seems to have struggled with his attraction to other men, something which he denied, but which everyone around him seems to have known about, including a few people who claim to be ex-lovers. Anyway, if you want some of that piano-based classical music product, you could do a lot worse than putting on some Horowitz. He was a real showman whose fingers could fly frantically, but who could also bring you to tears. That Moscow concert of his keeps getting uploaded to YouTube, so you might as well watch it. Okay, so that's Horowitz. Now here's Grit. So Grit was a weekly newspaper whose subtitle was America's Greatest Family Newspaper. Subscriptions were often sold by kids who traveled door to door, and as we see in today's episode, ads in comic books encouraged those kids to make money selling Grit. Grit's approach, family-friendly, very positive, supportive of rural America's lifestyle and traditions, made it very popular. And in fact, it's still being published today as a glossy magazine that comes out every other month. During the general hospital short, we see Nurse Jessie looking despondent, and Joel quips, When Ann Sexton throws a party. Ann Sexton was a mid-century American poet who wrote confessional verse. She's often grouped with her friend Sylvia Plath, and like Plath, Sexton struggled with mental illness, ultimately taking her own life. And yes, Nurse Jessie does look a bit like her. Once her philandering husband has left, Nurse Jessie is left alone to clean up, and Tom quips, I think I'll put on my Dan Hill album. So yeah, not Wyndham Hill, Dan Hill, who you probably don't remember as the songwriter behind Sometimes When We Touch and Can't We Try. You know, can't we try just a little bit harder, that one? Anyway, the important thing here is Dan Hill, like me, is Canadian. At one point, Joel looks at Rocky Jones and quips, You know, Rocky's got all the facial expressions of Troy Tempest. Troy Tempest was the captain of Stingray, the fastest and most technologically advanced submarine that the World Aquanaut Security Patrol, or WASP, has. He's also a puppet from the 1964 TV show Stingray. Jerry and Sylvia Anderson gave a... Well, they gave us the names of the mole people who hang around Deep 13 in early seasons of MST3K, but they also gave us several Super Marionation puppet shows like Thunderbirds, Stingray, and Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons. And of course, those last two shows were re-edited into the very first and very second movies riffed by MST3K in the KTMA era, which we haven't done yet. Mm. Someday. Someday. The old professor looks at some sort of meter, and Rocky Jones asks him what the meter says. Except it comes out like this. We're driving missiles, Professor. What's your rating? The Beauty Myth. Naomi Wolf's 1990 book, The Beauty Myth, argued that the more social power women have gained, the more expectations of physical beauty were leveraged against them. It was an idea that resonated with people, and the author quickly became a leader in third-wave feminism. Since then, uh... Well, okay, see, there's a different person named Naomi Klein, a Canadian author who had a hit a few years later with a political book called No Logo. Klein just recently published a book called Doppelganger, all about how she is often confused with Naomi Wolf, a confusion that has only gotten more frustrating as Wolf has gone deeper and deeper into right wing politics and conspiracy theories. Now, I haven't read Naomi Klein's new book yet, but excerpts that were published in a few magazines were super compelling. And, uh, oh, wait, something tells me that that's time. And that's time! We need to talk about how soap operas have affected other parts of our, like, media culture. In particular, I want to talk about pigs in space okay uh that is somewhere between a 
soap opera and Rocky Jones. I think that fits. Wow. It's funny because in my memory, I feel like Pigs in Space was a soap opera. And in my mind, I'm thinking of, you know, so I should describe Pigs in Space just in case we have some listeners who didn't regularly watch The Muppet Show in the 70s and 80s. Um, The Pigs in Space was a sketch that showed up on The Muppet Show, and it had three pigs inside of a rocket, not unlike the rocket that Rocky Jones and Winky has, but it is pig shaped. So that's kind of cool, sort of, sort of pig shaped, but it's very cool. And they have, adventures in space where stuff happens. But in my memory, this was like a Miss Piggy vamping it up with these other two people, the scientist and the like heartthrob captain. And in my mind, it's a soap opera. Right. I mean, it's not not in a certain sense. I mean, it's more like Star Trek than it is like General Hospital. I mean, the ship that they're on is the Swine Trek. So yes, it is a bit Star yeah. Trek. It's, I mean, obviously, right? But it's, it's, in my mind, I'm remembering it more like a soap opera than like a Star Trek-esque thing. And then I watch it and it's like, no, my memory is completely wrong about this. I totally shipped Miss Piggy and the and captain it, of Link that Hart- ship. Link Hogthrop, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe because his name, like his hogthrop, which now just sounds totally wrong to me. But like <laughs> in my mind, this was um in my memory at least, this was a soap opera. Um it does have some things in common with the soap opera, right? It has some continuing characters and it's short sketches and at You know, it wasn't like every Muppet show that had a Pigs in Space segment, but they would have a short little, like, three, four-minute sketch, and the characters would interact, and they had some personal conflicts that they would have to um, work through, but they were also working to try and save themselves in space. Uh Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Were you conflating Pigs in Space and the other Muppet show recurring sketch, Veterinarian's Hospital? So, when you suggested that I watch some Veterinarian's Hospital after I said, let's talk about pigs in space, I went back and watched Veterinarian's Hospital. And other than the opening of Veterinarian's Hospital, I wouldn't describe that as a soap opera either. (laughs) It's just a setup for a whole lot of puns. And there is nothing wrong with that, everybody. You know, like three, four minutes of sketches where it's just Rolf and Miss Piggy and Janice and a patient going pun after pun after pun. (gasps) Oh, it's delightful. Oh, it's super good. But Other than the beginning, it doesn't feel like a soap opera because it's not, it doesn't have any of the interpersonal dynamics going on that you get in Pigs in Space and General Hospital. Um, But it does kind of have that continuing saga of three people trying to operate on patients and they're all terrible at their jobs. I mean, and yet it produced the quintessential soap opera line, which is from the opening where the announcer goes, and now the continuing story of a quack who's gone to the dogs, which, like, as we've been talking about General Hospital, that line and that read of that line oh. is just in my head constantly. So, Well, yes. Oh. It's right up there with, like, sands through the hourglass. I mean. <laughs> it's real good. It's real good. But the pigs in space had a lot of interpersonal dynamics, so I think it falls more on that soap opera line. Okay. However, most of the interpersonal politics was all... The two guys trying to make Miss Piggy cook and clean and do the laundry. Sure. I mean, that's like almost all of the episodes that I watched were were going to be tricking Miss Piggy into doing the cooking, the cleaning, and the laundry. I went to 11 years of school in order to learn how to push this button to make this happen. And yet, Captain Hogthrob is going to sit there telling her how to do her job the entire time until she misses the point in time where she's supposed to do her job, which is pushing a button. Yep. So super fun things like that happen inside of (laughs) Pigs in Space. But it's lots of fun. It's a fun little... 
soap opera, and it happens in space, which makes it just like Rocky and Winky, but with, you know, Vina inside of the spaceship with them. Now, I guess it can't have Winky. That's sort of the problem. It has to have the bumbling professor, because the third character is, you know, a scrawny, glasses-wearing, German-accented professor. Yes, I had to look it up, but it's Dr. Julius Strange Pork. Strange Pork. (laughs) Yeah. It's a good name. I know. It's a really good name. (laughs) Chris, it feels like, at long last, we are done talking about Rocky Jones and his adventures in space and... Well, I don't know. I'm wondering if maybe you have a final factoid for our listeners. I do, or at least a final thing I want to talk about. So, in today's episode, Joel and the Bots, as an invention exchange, offer the Rock and Wreck guitar, which is a guitar that you can play and then smash and then put it back together. Because, you know, bands like to be cool, they like to smash guitars, but they also cost a lot of money, these guitars, and they don't want to... They can't afford that. They're not being sponsored by a guitar company that gives them guitars to smash on stage to appear cool, like certain other famous guitar smashing bands I can think of. Ooh, that's cold, Chris, but go on. I mean, it's just, it's true. I mean, it's pretty cool. Like, they were given the money and the guitars to do it. Why not? Just go for it. Yeah, I guess so, right? Were, I'm just... sure they were pretty low-end guitars. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, all I wanted to say is that uh, I was in a band where I did not play guitar in this band. I played keyboards in it. But in one of the last shows that we ever did, the leader of the band, who was also the guitarist, decided he wanted to have his moment of glory and smash a guitar. Glory equals smashing a guitar. In this case, yes. I mean, it's a specific type of glory. It's true. And may we all have our own particular specific type of glory. Were you at that show? I don't... I don't know. I don't think I was. I feel like you'd remember it if you had been. The... The main takeaway that I want to give you of trying to destroy an electric guitar on stage in a small pub in Portland in, you know, 2007-ish, is that guitars are not made to be smashed, especially like solid-body electric guitars. And it was very difficult for him to actually damage the guitar. It took quite a lot of hacking and slamming and thudding while the rest of us vamped around it before he could actually (laughs) make a dent in it, and much longer before it finally, like, crumpled and gave out a lot of feedback. And, like, (sighs) you know, it wasn't as musically explosive as you might have hoped from that. Uh, I, I guess he hadn't practiced. It sounds like he didn't quite get the glory that he wanted from his moment. I mean, you know, he he gets to tell all his friends about it, and uh, people are talking about it on podcasts to this day. No, I guess that's true. But it reminds me of one of my favorite soap opera moments. Okay. (laughs) So there was a soap opera scene where this woman who was very sad and very angry, like she just found out that her boyfriend was cheating or, or whatever. She was inside of a restaurant. She was totally mad, totally mad. And the direction was she was supposed to grab the tablecloth and yank it so that everything on the table fell down on the ground. But instead, she yanked it so hard that it just fell out and left everything on the table and immediately she burst out laughing because it was <laughs> such an unexpected moment oh. and it's like that's kind of what your friend had the unexpected this is not how this is supposed to go this is supposed to be dramatic and big <laughs> and short yeah. i will say uh, if anybody is thinking about uh, Destroying a guitar on stage as part of their band, especially if they're doing it in a relatively small club, um, Mm -hmm. uh, consider safety goggles. And also, (laughs) let the venue know ahead of time you're going to be doing this, which which my friend did, so it's it's all fine. But like, that's good, you know. Yeah, be sensitive. It's a shame you didn't all put on your safety goggles at the same time. We might have. I can't remember. (gasps) Oh my god! I think I think we might have even thought of that and done it. I don't know. I'll have to check in with them. If you've been affected by the issues on this show, if your moment of glory took longer than expected, or if you'd like to ask us anything, get in touch with us. Our email is info at itsjustashow.com, and we'd love to hear from you. 
This show is made possible by listeners like you and like our randomly selected supporter, Marty. Thank you, Marty. For as little as $1 an episode, you too can be like Marty and help us research and record this show. You can join us in a friendly Discord, and you can listen to all our superfan bonus bits. Find out more at itsjustashow.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash itsjustashow. And if you want to follow up on anything that was mentioned today, you'll find links in our show notes at itsjustashow.com slash episode slash 144. All right. Are you ready for even more Rocky Jones? No, no. Well, I've <laughs> no! got a Christmas present for you because we're doing a holiday movie. <gasps> We will, in fact, be doing Season 6, Episode 17, The Sword and the Dragon. Ooh, this is one of our russo Finnish movies, is that right? That is what they call it. Oh, well, we'll have to see if it's as good as Sinbad. If this Sword and the Dragon has the animatronic skeletons that I've been looking forward to, like, hands down, it'll be the best Christmas movie ever. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe I ought to rethink that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, surprise, surprise. It's one of those movies which is considered a classic in the original and is pretty beautiful. It's by Alexander Petushko again. Uh, it is not Finnish at all. That only happened once. <laughs> but they're uh-huh. going to make lots of Finland jokes over the course of the episode. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a, a grummy, a grummy, a grimy print that was uh, dubbed and edited. And that will not show it off in its best glory. But... There you go. That's all right. Sometimes Christmas doesn't come to us in its best glory. So we'll take what we get. Well, it's been a little while since I've watched this one, and I remember it being pretty great, and I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Oh, I'm so glad. But until then... Oh, sweet cake, you're the only one who understands me. Yep, I'm afraid he's an infant, but he will grow out of it. Take it away, theme squad. <laughs>